feeling pretty good. Looking forward to some games. Yeah, this map is definitely a lot more interesting. It's a lot more um, co team comp variety than other maps we see. And I just realized my mic was muted this entire time, so... Um, wow, that damn sucks. I didn't realize my mic was muted. But... Uh, wow, this is so awkward. Anyways, I'm going to just quickly say what I just said. Welcome to uh, NGS Storm Division between Team Backdoor and Wild Heart Omega. The map bands and picks are in front of you. And I was mentioning earlier, when I was muted, because I'm a bit <laughs> dookie on that part, I was mentioning how both Team Backdoor and Wild Heart Omega are currently in the 5th and 6th place of the standings. Of course, top 6 does make it through to playoffs. However, you don't want to be uh, in the playoffs in the last seeds. You know, you kind of want to ease your... Uh, ease your um, ease yourself by getting yourself in a higher standings. Uh, higher standings means that you're in a more advantageous position to win it all. So indeed, both of these teams are definitely fighting for a better position in the playoffs. And they will definitely be fighting really hard. Like I said, they're 5th and 6th just holding each other. So this match does mean quite a bit to both teams. So we'll definitely see a lot of thrilling action. Um, so we're just waiting on the lobby to be made and ready to go. So just hang on tight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, like I said, the first map is the BOE. So what kind of things are you going to be expecting on BOE here, Malios? Well, as standard BOE calls, like both teams will want to draft some sort of race potential to melt the immortal and get the objective for themselves. Uh, crowd control and the ability to CC your opponents, as well as displacement tools such as Junkrat and those who are able to take advantage of terrain will be also quite nice to have as well. Yeah, I mean, we definitely want to see stuff like that, you know, point control is very important. Now, of course, it's more untraditional in the sense that it isn't a, a firm uh, point control area, but, you know, getting able to protect your immortal or kind of prevent them from uh, defending their immortal is indeed very important. Like you mentioned, the Junkrat, you know, those traps, those steel traps, those concussive mines can really be bothersome when trying to approach the Junkrat team. And of course, Immortal Melt is also not that bad of an option from time to time. It would be nice for them to pick up, for example, a Vala, Hanzo, things that can really win the Immortal race and kind of like make it difficult for a team to respond to that. Yeah, for sure, Creep. Like, we want to also mention that Displacement Tools would also be able to help uh, any given team to be able to utilize their Immortals' uh, stuns because once in a while, the Immortal will stun on certain areas, so being able to displace your enemies onto those uh, burst damage stuns will actually help you during a team fight. Yeah, you know, you have things like Alarak, you have ETC, those potential heroes can just be so bothersome with the displacement methods, and if they're able to time it perfectly, they would reward themselves with, I think, two seconds done? Yep, two seconds. Yeah, give or take, which is really impactful in these high-level gameplay, ladies and gentlemen. In these high-tier matches, a two-second stun could really mean the difference between winning and losing a team fight. So we shall see if they decide to do any of that strategy. Of course, they can just go to traditional, you know, front-to-back comp where they melt the tanks and then finish off the back line. Or they can go play some more, you know, intensive dive comps. You know, really want to get rid of those carries out of the way before they're finishing off the rest of the teams. I, I do want to kind of mention, though, um, about the map, uh, map bans. I'm going to bring it back to the map bans view, ladies and gentlemen. 
Garden of Terror and Curse of the Hollow are banned by Team Backdoor, which kind of indicates they're not very strong at picking, uh, playing big maps, you know. Curse of the Hollow and uh, Garden of Terror are very obnoxious in the sense that it's a very large map. Not only is it a large map, getting objective on that map is extremely difficult and sometimes very irrelevant in the early stages of the game. So indeed, we kind of see that kind of a uh, kind of a uh, kind of a pattern emerging from Team Backdoor's band. And of course, on the other side, Dragonshire and Sky Temple are much more objective orientated. Uh, still, a lot of macro is related since they are relatively big maps, so we, they're going to be definitely seeing a lot of macro on those maps. However, they did ban both those maps out, so that indicates that they are not a fan of that kind of style of play, which kind of brings me to conclude that they probably both teams really like team fighting, right? Yeah, maybe. Maybe they're comfortable with a lockdown comp and being able to isolate an opponent and forcing a fight. Indeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting ready for our first game. We're now in the draft on Battlefield of Eternity. As always, on the left is Team Backdoor, and they do have the option of the first pick. So, let's see. Will they ban the Junkrat? Will they ban the Stitches? Kind of the more typical bans you'll see. Yep. I forgot to mention that there's also like very strong healers which are also typically banned heroes such as Anduin, Stukov, Brightwing. These are all heroes you typically see at this level of play. So I won't be surprised, especially in Stukov's case, uh, be banned in this early phase. I mean, a Stukov ban really is a quite aggressive play if you are banning first phase. So I, I agree that Stukov isn't that uh, impressive in the sense that it's a priority ban. So they decided to go ban the Nubrak instead. Well, this is interesting. We have a Lenara band coming out on the side of Wildheart Omega. Now, Lenara is a hero we really don't talk about often. Like, it, it's it's in a weird state where uh, Lenara is a very solid hero, but nobody really wants to play her. Do you know really exact? Do you do you know why that nobody wants to play Lenara? I will uh, mention a couple things about Lenara related to this map in particular. At level four, she does do a, an extra 125 percent damage to non-heroes mean that her objective race is actually very strong on this map in particular. Uh, but to go back to your particular question before on why hero people don't like playing Lenara is because she doesn't really do too much, like she doesn't have the ability to finish off a target until much further in the, into the game. And her damage is relatively low early game. Yeah, she does take a, quite a bit to scale, but you know who doesn't take a, quite a bit to scale? Li Ming being picked mm -hmm. up first. By none other than, of course, Carbon. Yeah, the Limian pick in general is not a bad pick overall. Um, if the enemy team does choose to body block uh, for them so that the Immortal doesn't take any health damage, uh, the Limian at level 4 will be able to essentially almost reset her cooldown for her W, allowing her to keep on dishing out poke damage as well. Yeah, so on the other side, we're going to see the Malfurion and Sonya locked up. Very interesting picking up the Malfurion very early in the draft, mm -hmm. as well as the Sonya. So what are your thoughts on that, actually? Um, It's still not entirely clear where they're trying to bring their draft to, because you don't really associate Sonya and Malfurion together, per se. And it is quite peculiar in the sense that they chose their soul laner so early on into the draft. But we'll see how it goes from here on out. Yeah, and we will see a little bit of the Vala and Diablo picked up. Really standard pick mm -hmm. so far coming out of Team Backdoor. Of course, Vala and Diablo has been raiding Terror as one of the more commonly picked in high elo. So I'm not too surprised I'm really locking in these solid uh, heroes as well. Kind of pairing it with the Lee Mink can really set up for a lot of burst damage. For sure. Like, Vala has very strong racing abilities and in general just a very strong DPS hero while Diablo is able to utilize the walls on this map in order to uh, combo using his devastating charge as well he could just flip enemies into the immortal stun as well which is something we've mentioned earlier on yeah so the brands of the second phase comes to Brightwing and Garrosh and I really do like both these bands you know Brightwing is a really yep. good follow up for a Diablo charge and a Polymorph can really be hindrance mm -hmm. a lot of times and Garrosh is obviously one of the best combos with Malfurion tossing him into the root is one of the most textbook combos you'll see yep. and we'll see the Maiev and Johanna locked in oh this is interesting now that is interesting uh one more thing I do want to mention is that like uh, back to our previous theme, uh, that Garrosh is able to toss enemies into a uh, Daymortal stun as well, uh, which means he doesn't have to rely on the Malfurion either. The Maev is obviously a very interesting pick in this case, as if she's able to leash 
some targets, especially some high power targets, uh, she'll be able to rain some terror onto this game. Yeah, so the, the draft really comes to a quick close when Blaze and Andrew is locked in on the side of Team Backdoor and Reb picking up the Sylvanas. This is quite a solid draft from both teams, really. A lot of solid potential and really good counterplay uh, options for both teams. Yep, yeah, sure. I actually do like the Blaze pick in particular, even though he doesn't necessarily beat lane against Sonya, just having a bunker ready for whenever uh, those in uh, Wild Heart uh, like tries to uh, engage, just being able to pop that bunker will be able to negate a lot of that uh, engagement. Yeah, so that's indeed going to be very solid. Um, I, I really do want to see this Diablo pop off. I think he is potentially going to pop off. Like He has Mayav and Savannah as the really the, the priority targets. So there's a lot of room for them to really get down the solid TC chain that he needs. Um, yep. I'm not too sure how the Blaze and Sonya lane works. Uh, do you know, Malios? Well, for sure, Blaze doesn't win per se, but he's able to hold the lane, and Sonya won't be able to push in too far as long as he plays his cards right. And so we it's are, like yeah. It's a wall, essentially. Indeed. So we are actually ready to get into game number one. Ladies and gentlemen, on the left is Team Backdoor. We have Corbin on his signature Li Ming, Jachuggy on the Diablo, Heavy is going to be playing the Anduin, Unadverted on Divala, and Liam 30k on the Blaze. And on the right, we have Wildheart Omega. We have Slug Hunter on the Malfurion, Rev on the Maev, Gorge Rhea on the Sonya, Brown Bala on the Sylvanas, and Lupus on that Johanna. Oh, I saw Slug Hunter just toss a Q out for no reason. Oh, you just lost like, what, 30 mana? I don't know how much that thing does. <laughs> Value. Value indeed. And we'll see the level 1 talents picked up here. Instantly, you know, maybe perhaps an interesting picks. Of course, Vala going for the Puncture Arrow kind of means that you want to go for that Monster Hallet. Monster Hunter, sorry, talent at level 7. Of course, the Social pick up at Diablo as well. Yeah, there are several talents to note. Number 1. Um, the Johanna did opt to go for double blind at level 1, meaning that she was planning to use that flashlight talent to be able to blind that ball of damage. Yeah, double blind is not something you see often in Johanna players these days, but I guess they really want to deny Vala of any damage and pressure in, in the team fights. Now, I do want to emphasize that Laws of Hope is uh, significantly weaker on this map, given how few globes actually uh, are being taken when most of the fighting happens in the mid lane. Or the lack of a mid lane. Yeah. A lot of just trading back and forth. You definitely know that Sylvanas and uh, the Limi are really just trading blows left and right. Of course, there is going to be more poke potential on the side of Team Backdoor in the bottom lane due to the Li Ming and Vala option. Where Mayav's more of an all in kind of hero play. You can't really poke with your Qs as much as you think. And we see an early rotation coming from Liam, which means they're going to grant themselves the bottom siege camp. So a good rotation from Blaze to really secure themselves in a good 5 4 position and get that early bottom XP. Yeah, for sure. The Sonya wasn't in position to be rotating down, so instead she opted to go for the top camp instead. Oh, a good flip onto Johanna, but it's going to pop the Iron Skin, so he's going to be just fine. A good stun on the wall, actually, but it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. Johanna is just a tanky girl. Take a look at the top side here. We have Reb and Gojira working on the siege camp. Of course, Liam can't really do anything in a 2v1 situation as a blaze, so he's going to grant themselves the top siege camp in the turn. So, nothing lost, nothing lost. Luke is actually really low here. I didn't see what happened. Did he get charged by Diablo again? I'm not entirely sure. I wasn't looking myself. Unfortunate. Caster sucks. <laughs> But yeah, we're gonna see level four is picked up while both teams are getting ready for the first immortal phrase at three minute mark. You see, already they're starting on their bruiser camp, and I expect both of them just to cap the bruiser camp at around two fifty, regardless of when they finish it. Uh, at level four, you do see several talent variations, uh, namely on the Li Ming. She did go for charge blast instead of the standard W talent, which reduces the CDR, meaning that she's hoping to use her Q on the immortal to increase their race potential. You also see the percentage based damage on. My abs is E, meaning that she is quite concerned about Diablo and Blaze's health pool. Speaking of Diablo, uh, Jachagi getting a lot of damage here on Lupus, and this is earlier, but oh, Melee Hots, thank you for the 500 bits. Nice to see you enjoying the content, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the game as well. As the first Immortal phase has spawned, the bottom Bruiser camp is starting to siege on the bottom, uh, the gate, and that's actually the gate down instantly, so. 
Already a lot of structural advances. Brawn Ball is gonna be careful. Vala is just a, a threat to be reckoned with. Yeah, what you saw there was the repeating arrow talent level 4, resetting that hungering arrow and enabling Vala to shoot another Q and do an extra burst damage on that Sylvanas. Yeah, you, you can't play too like dangerous like that. You saw that Sylvanas was already low to begin with, but when Sylvanas still stepped up, a good charge onto Mafir and there's a root follow up there, and yes it is, Slug Hunter is in big trouble here. Sub 200 health, Andrew's doing his best to do the damage, and it's a 5v4 situation, which means of course Wildheart Omega is going to have to be on the retreat for now. Lupus is next to fall, and Gojira with 50 HP actually makes it out alive. Yeah, there you just saw the, like, the insane damage pen potential that uh, the team in the blue has over the side of Wildheart. Like, just the ability to burst down heroes with Leeming's full combo and double hungering hero, as well as the Elvis charge, is like a threat to be uh, worried about. I'm not really too sure why Malfarian was positioned in that way. It was a 5v4 situation. I guess Malfarian got a bit overzealous thinking that, oh, you know, uh, it's going to be 5v5 soon. I can step up a little bit. But Jachucky really punishing it well by getting this mortal stun working in its favor as well. So really a good engage from Jachucky and earn himself a first objective and the level 7 talent advantage. Yeah, for sure. And this was even before Vala got the monster 100 uh, talent as well, meaning that future race potential for the Immortal will be even faster than they have now. So yeah, the Monster Hunter is picked up as we predicted the beginning in the game, so we're going to see the Immortal Melt really ascend in the later stages of the game. But for now, they're going to take this about half shield Immortal and start sieging itself in the top lane. Of course, the Immortal will always go to the lane that has least structural damage, in this case will be the top. A good combo to Chichuggy is going to force out the Soul Shield. And nothing else is going to come from this. Here comes Liam 30k with a good gank. This is a 5 4 situation. Once again, the cleanse is not enough, and the Sylvanas goes down once again. Oh, Liam's asleep, but I guess there's, I don't think there's really anything they can do to this Blaze. Yeah, Blaze is technically still in the tank role, so he is very chunky. But yeah, that was a really good engage once again. You did see the Malfurion cleanse try to come through. But Malfurion's cleanse is kind of wacky in a sense that it's not it's not a true cleanse in a sense, and I guess it just wasn't enough for that situation. Yep, it's a soft cleanse, meaning that it gets rid of all CC at the moment, but any CC that's reapplied uh, isn't affected by it. Yeah, so contrary to what you're known to as the regular cleanses, such as Unstoppables, your Unstoppable means that you can't be stopped, which means CC has no way of stopping you. I think the only CC that can stop you is Stasis's, so like... Chromie's Time Trap and like Maze Ice Wall, those are the only ways to really stop a cleanse. Yeah. But the benefit of having Malfurion's version of the soft cleanse is that he is able to soft cleanse all his allies at the same time, as opposed to just one single target. Yes, of course. So being able to apply your regrowth to multiple allies means you can get multiple cleanses. But in reality, it's not that much value because chances are you're using your cleanse on one person anyway. Yep, for sure. Like it's good in theory, but in practice you would just rather have a standard cleanse. Level 10s are picked up on the side of TBD, and of course they're going to grab themselves this bottom uh, bottom 4. I don't think there's any contention coming in. I mean, they are without 10s. Uh, oh no, the Jitagi is coming on to the Johanna. The Iron Skin is forced to be popped as a 40 second cooldown. That's going to be unactive for the next 40 seconds, as mentioned earlier. And now the 5 man siege is starting to begin here on Team Backdoor. They're going to take their advantage. Wow, that really stunned? That was weird. <laughs> that was an interesting angle. Yeah, wow, that, that's wacky, man. If the Maiev, if the Maiev yeah. actually died from that, I would actually be kind of surprised. Or like that would be so tragic. <laughs> yeah, like if she was lower health and just that damage onto the wall just killed her, that would have been that, that would have been one of the most like tragic ways to go in one of the weirdest stunts. <laughs> For sure. So Immortals are spawning in about 10 seconds, and Team Backdoor is going to pick up their free Bruiser camp. Of course, there's Wildheart Omega still without tens. This is starting to get a bit tense because. Once they get 10s, the race to 20 really becomes unfavorable in their position. And speaking of 10s, they have just picked it up. A lot of heroics are picked on both sides. Interesting. We'll talk about them later, but first let's take a look at the Immortal phase. You see all five members really positioning around the defensive mode for Wildheart Omega. But like I said, Li Ming Vala, it's a lot of poke. Like They can easily slowly chip away this Immortal, and there isn't a way for Wildheart Omega to do anything unless they hard engage. And yeah, the halftime is already won with basically full health and of course a top bruiser pushing. They gotta make something happen really soon or this is gonna be trouble for Wildheart Omega. The root's gonna land, Lupus is gonna get stunned. Liam tried to go for a propelling bass and here we go. 
The stun landing onto the Mayev is going to get cleansed as well from the Johanna. And this is a lot of damage from the Lightning Breath. And yes, here comes Carbon with the resets. Brown Ball is going to be able to run away with his uh, Banshee Wave. But that's it, ladies and gentlemen. A full health Immortal and a quick fight to secure themselves the second Immortal of the game. Yeah, what you saw earlier just now, when Diablo and Blaze went into the bunker after Sylvanas used her full uh, combo on them, is that they went into the bunker to remove all poison damage. That is actually very, very well played. I actually didn't even notice that. So Blaze's bunker actually reducing so much damage over time means that they're so healthy throughout the middle and later stages of the game. Yeah, for sure. Like... Um, because Sylvanas' main damage is damage over time after Shagger, Shadow Dagger is propped. But since they went into the bunker, essentially they didn't take that much damage at all. Yeah, so right now we have a full shield Immortal with a at the towards the bottom keep that has no gate. And here we go, the Wrath of the Berserker is popped by Sonya, and here comes the Falling Rays as well. But so much damage on the Sonya once again. He's already on retreat, and once again, Carbon does have the resets should he want to go in. Savannah is doing his best, but is really trying to make the best out of the worst case situation. But what can a Savannah do against such a good coordinated team? Liam 30k going once again onto Lucas. And here comes the Mayev engage. Chucky's in big trouble here, taking a lot of damage, and he's gonna get he's gonna get killed by Mayev. Oh, wow. Next one to fall is probably gonna be unadverted. Pop the spell what shield? Oh yeah, unfortunately, Rev was not able to get the kill just yet. Iron skin is popped, plus the engage from the Will Lucas. Hero missed? Oh, and yeah, Unaverted is going to get caught by the Tether, which means that it's a 2 for 0 in favor of Wild Heart Omega, but at what cost? They lose their bottom keep, plus about 60% damage. damage on the core, maybe even more, 56, 50? Oh, it's only going to be 50, 50. yes, yeah. so exactly 50, so they were able to turn the team fight, but they lost so much more to a point that it may not even be worth it at this point. Well, since we have a downtime, I do want to bring our attention to the talent picks. Something I do want to mention and bring uh, some attention to is Wrath of the Berserker being picked instead of the Leap, which we have been seeing more often. Uh, I'm not too entirely sure if this was the right pick, especially how squishy the backline of Team Backdoor is, especially since Lee Main went for Glass Canyon this game. Oh. So I believe that the Leap probably would have been a better pick in this game. Uh, Wow. Blaze uh, actually I, I mean, Blaze, Blaze just 1v, try to 1v4 for some reason, and I don't oh, know. Oh, Diablo. Let's try to s stall recalls, stall. I guess. Yeah, for the keep top. I guess it worked. Yeah, I guess it worked. So, the Blaze 1v4 really wasn't meant to try to steal the camp at all. That's actually a really smart play coming from deep back door. They know they were at the top uh, siege camp. They want to push this in. So they really made Blaze sacrifice himself for the top keep. That's a very smart play, actually. You don't see from a lot of teams. Yep, it's definitely the better play in the long run. As long as they don't stagger right now, uh, they're basically better off. Wow, that's actually a really smart play if you think about it. <laughs> I, I thought Blaze was just running it down, but oh man, <laughs> cast their small brain. <laughs> but yeah, here we go. The next Immortal Frights is going to spawn. Both teams are going to have their bruisers up. And of course, Team Factor has their bruiser to be much more pressured because of the lack of keeps. From the side of Wildheart Omega. We see a 5-man attempt trying to do a lot of damage here to this top side of the map. Um, the, the Wrath of the Berserker is actually popped for this moment. And this could be small a lot of trouble here. Here comes the reinforcement. Jachogi is trying to look for something. But without 6 scenes, I don't think they're willing to fight just yet. Lupa is trying to plant something here in this bush. I don't know if he's going to get anything off here. And looks, Look at the team of Team Backdoor. They know that they're really near 16. They don't want to do anything. So they're playing defensively here. And Go Gojira actually hooks in. But I guess he's able to just walk out just fine. 20 seconds until Wrath of Berserker is up. All other heroics are up. Here comes the Reign of Vengeance landing onto Reb. Reb is going to get melted from the Lightning Breath, but not fallen. The Leap of Fates is used onto Jachage. Diablo's going to get out in this situation. Here comes Liam 30k with a good gank. A two-man stun. Pops the bunker. Brown Ball taking so much damage. Oh, once wow. again, the like Hungry arrow. arrow finishes off the Sylvanas. And here comes Carbon once again with the resets. Of course, Glass Cannon means he's going to be squishier, but that is, doesn't mean anything. Blaze finishing off Maiev and Gojira's next to fall. And ladies and gentlemen, with almost a team wipe in favor, we might see the end of the game here. Yeah. Like, even if they stay alive, they still have to, like, run away and make us back to core while Blaze chases them. So this is basically game at this point. Yeah, I mean, there's nobody stopping them, ladies and gentlemen. Game number one, in a quite a fast fashion, going to Team Backdoor. GG, and well played.
Wow, that was pretty quick, actually. That was definitely quite... Like you said, it was a very quick game, and it, had, it, like, it was pretty anticlimactic at the end. I mean, it was it just came down to really snowball. I think, right? You snowball the lead at the first objective. You get the bottom key, uh, bottom four. You get the bottom keep gate, and you don't look back. And this is this is the really the power of snowball. If you're able to really play around your advantages, it's really hard to come back from that. And I think Team Backdoor showed a very good showing on how not to lose a lead. Yeah, for sure. Like not to mention their draft in general was the stronger side on the team of uh, Team Backdoor. Like, I understand what um, Wild Heart Omega was trying to do with the Malfurion, but at the end of the day, with the burst potential, with the Vala and the Li Ming, the healing output from Malfurion wasn't able to save their team from too much of their damage. Like, you saw Sylvanas just get melted from Hungering Arrows, which was shot, like, several seconds ago. And Malfurion's, like, passive healing just simply was enough to keep up with that uh, Hungering Arrow bounce. Yeah, and it really shows both Vala and Li Ming doing quite a bit of damage, around 30k for both of them, and only Savannah is landing around 26k. Um, Draft-wise, what do you think could be done better from Wild Heart Omega? I think the draft, was, like you said, it wasn't in favor of Team Backdoor, but what would you have liked to see change from Wild Heart Omega in order to get a better draft? I didn't like the Malfurion first pick, uh, purely because I didn't believe that he was that high prio. Like, you have just, like, more, like, popular, like, Better, I don't want to say better, but like those like healers that are uh, in the meta, such as like Stuka of Brightwing. I don't, although Brightwing was banned later on, but it wasn't banned early in the draft. And you have Anduin, which was picked relatively later on in the draft as well. I didn't think that the Melfian needed to be picked so early. If they wanted it, I believe they would have been able to take it later on instead. Yeah, I think the Malfarian reveal really showed that Malfarian isn't really known for his heals. So in in a in a long sense, the longer the fight lasts, the the less healing that Malfarian does compared to Anduin. So there is gonna you are gonna see a decline in healing during the fights, and I think that's what they really capitalize. You know, Malfarian yep. isn't also known for burst healing either. So being able to melt Savannah very quickly is something that uh, Team Backdoor really capitalized on. Yep. I also just want to mention that there are several ult choices on the side of Wild Heart uh, Omega that I didn't really enjoy. Uh, in particular, I believe that Wrath was the wrong call in this case. Like, you saw how much damage that Poison Spear did to like Li Ming, especially with Glass Ten. You saw like he literally just speared her, and like her health pool just like like disintegrated. Like, if you were able to pair that with Leap instead, I believe that you would have had so much more value out of it. Like, as well, I don't think Tranquility from Malfurion was the right call either. I believe that the Silence would have made a lot more sense in this game. I mean, I, I think both Malfurion and Heroes are kind of like, are, are, are a bit weak in the sense that I don't think they both get as much value as uh, Wild Heart had hoped. Uh, mm -hmm. But like he said, I do, I would have liked to see the Leap more than the, uh, the Wrath of the Berserker. Because at the end of the day, Wrath of the Berserker cannot beat... A Li Ming plus a Vala, unless you're right in their faces, and that's you didn't see that at all during the game. The front line was really just too much forward, so we need to rock up to them. Yeah, you know that like Team Backdoor was confident when they chose Glass Canyon with Calamity. Like it really shows like how like the pressure wasn't on them, but rather on the side of Wild Heart Omega. Yeah, so being able to analyze that Li Ming's never getting dived and choosing Glass Cannon as a reward was indeed a good analysis coming in from Carbon, realizing that, hey, I'm never getting dived. I'm just going to do more damage. <laughs> yeah, you just see like Carbon just shooting all his skill shots across the wall, smacking the Immortal, and you just saw the side of Wild Heart Gaming. Like, they're like kind of confused whether or not they want to like protect the Immortal and like s get smacked with the skill shots or just let it keep on taking poke damage instead. Yes, so we are ready to head into map number two. I have not updated anything because I'm Omega behind. Uh, blah, 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 bum. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you the map before we get into the draft. Really quickly, we are going into Tomb of the Spider Queen picked by Team Backdoor, which means that Wild Heart Omega does have the first pick option. Now, Tomb of the Spider Queen is something that I expect both teams to perform very well. As we mentioned in, earlier in the stream, they banned a lot of the big maps. They don't really like playing big maps. Curse of Hollow, you know, Sky Temple, Gardens of Terror, even Dragon Shard is on a relatively big side. So picking Tomb of the Spider Queen is something that I really have expected. 
Yeah. I would say uh, in this map in particular, I believe that wave clear is the most important aspect of this map compared to every other map in the map pool. So that's something we should uh, take note of as you're drafting in this game. That being said, Lenora was banned again, leaving me to believe that uh, Team Backdoor just simply likes playing that hero as opposed to just being a target ban for that map. Yeah, I mean, at this at this point, Lenara banned on Tomb of the Spider Queen does say something that perhaps they've done their scouting and they've said, hey, you know, this maybe it's Carbon, I think maybe Carbon has a good Lenara. Uh, check maybe in 4 beam, but I don't know. Maybe they just know that, hey, one of them plays a really good Lenara and we don't have a really good way to deal with it, so let's get it out of the way. So they got rid of that. And so the bans have proceeded to be Junkrat and Stukov. Malfurion being banned also is kind of odd in my opinion. Uh, especially now that they picked the Medivh, so I um, let's talk about the Medivh first, really. What are your thoughts on this pick? It's very standard overall. Like, it does mitigate most types of uh, burst comps and lockdown comps. Like, very in taunt. Stitches, like, Stitches, Flash Stitches hook. A new rack also gets um, mitigated quite hard. Not, like, to the same extent, but definitely does take a hit from the Medivh. As well as just, like, further mobility and able to just gank enemies as well as ley lined seal potential leaving me to believe that they'll pick a tank which can follow up to that such as apoc diablo for an example well we're gonna see a beetle being picked up and a fairy dragon a new barack and brightwing and on the other side we have a hot dude and a wolf <laughs> a hot dude <laughs> i don't know how to describe blaze man like, he's just a hot dude <laughs> all right let's just quickly talk about the blaze pick i actually really like this pick because um, this is like a pick that could be either taken as a main tank uh, pick or a solo lane pick. So it has that added flexibility added onto it in that on the side of Team Backdoor doesn't know uh, which in particular the side of Wildheart Gaming is planning on uh, utilizing. Yes, of course, you, having Blaze as a flex option really makes your team comp a lot more complicated and hard to counter. Uh, but we're gonna see the stitches band coming in. It, it probably the stitches band indicates that they think that this plays as an off laner and Cassia being banned as well. So very uh, typical bans I would say from both teams in this situation. Yeah, stitches and stitches in particular is a very famous combo uh, to pair with Medivh, and Cassia is just a very solid damage dealer. Speaking of damage dealer, why not just picking both your DPS up with a Mephisto and a Maiev and quickly countered mm. with the Tarande and Diablo. Yeah, like we've mentioned earlier, Diablo is a great pick to pair with the Medivh Leyline Seal. Uh, the Toronto is quite interesting, being able to grant vision using her Sentinel, as well as being able to follow up CC from Blaze, in particular with her Lunar Flare. Yeah, very interesting Tarande pick. We don't see Tarande very often. <laughs> like We go from Malfurion into Tarande. Very unorthodox healing picks, in my opinion. And the Lyric's mm. finally being picked up by Liam. Okay, so I would say that uh, Wild Heart Omega's draft is more coherent and it's more tight knit in that um, there's a lot more synergies going on when compared to the side of Team Backdoor. That being said, they have a severe lack of wave clear on your team. Uh, Wild Heart Omega? Yep. I mean, Grey Main and Blaze kind of does well. That's not enough. That's not enough on this map. You're absolutely right. It is not. I mean, two minutes Spider Queen is really based on how fast you can wave, uh, wave clear, so you can get to your rotations faster, pick up more gens, and turn earlier. I would have said the exact same for Team Backdoor, but he picked Leoric, which has Neo Peasant level 4, meaning that his Q, which already does a ton of damage to minions, will also do the, the, like the same amount of damage to monsters and mercenaries, as well as reduce his cooldown of that ability by half. Like, Lyric is just one of the best double soakers in the game right now. So, at this point, I believe that the wave clear is uh, significantly better on the side of Team Backdoor. Yes, indeed. And we shall see how that impacts the game. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in game number two. Team Backdoor on the left with a 1-0 lead. We have Unadverted on the Mephisto. Carbon playing the Maiev. And Jachuggy with the paws. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. We did see that Carbon had left. Oh, we're back in. Okay. Um, Where were you? <laughs> we were. I was right. Jachogi uh, on the new Brack. Heavy playing the Brightwing. And Liam 30k on the Leoric. And on the right, we have Wildheart Omega. We have Brown Bala on the Greymane. Gohora on the Blaze. Rev on the Medivh. 
Lupus on the Diablo and Slug Hunter on that Tyrande. I believe Slug Hunter is subbing in. Uh, this is, I think this is the first time we saw Slug Hunter. So they have a teammate. Uh, we saw her last round. Was it? Was it Slug yep. Hunter last round? I I don't recognize Brown Baller, but uh, that might just be me. Maybe it's just you. I don't know. Maybe there is a sub change. We I don't know because I was not paying attention because I'm a terrible caster. But it's all right. Let's get to my week. Take a look at the level one scrimmage here. Are there gonna be any talents that are peculiar? Yep, right off the bat we do see Devil's Do from Diablo, which is not picked very often. Typically when we see W build, we see Soul Shield, and any other build, we tend to see uh, Feast on Fear. So with Devil's Do, it is uh, less uh, clear what build Diablo will be going for in the future. That being said, Devil's Do is very strong on this map, as there are significantly more globes on the map. Man, uh, Devil's Do. Yeah. What else is interesting is Furious Spark coming out from Mephisto not being the standard talent anymore given the changes to Q, uh, the Q quest at level 1. But still a relatively strong talent overall. Yeah, for sure. And we're that's a very interesting thing. Like De Devil's Dew has definitely fallen off. I know back then when I first played Heroes of the Storm, Diablo was indeed I think my first hero I played. And Devil's Dew was all I went. <laughs> I don't think I've ever went a different level 1 for my entire life playing Diablo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we do see um, Memento coming from my app. Oh, we do see a flip combo on the top lane. Bye bye. And right wing's gone. Yeah. There yeah, you I... just saw like Diablo flip into the Tarande stun, uh, being able to lock down a single target. Yeah, so we can really start to see this potential of this comp. As you say, Diablo is one of the scariest initiation tanks, and you follow it up with a very, very precise, uh, not Lenara, sorry, Tarande stun. Which means that chances are that target is dead. Yeah. In the meantime, the side of Team Backdoor was able to get an entire gate bot at lane, while um, Diablo and Tarande was gonna kill top. So the, I will say that's actually quite good value for them. Yes. As the, is the map that is quite macro focused and structures matter a lot. Yes. So what separates good teams from great teams usually is what you do, what you can get done when you're behind. So noticing that uh, Heavy was taken out in the top lane, they realized that they could really get some more value coming on the bot lane. And yes, they did get an entire bottom game. And this is a very good macro decision coming in from Team Backdoor to really make it a good situation out of a bad one. Oh, mm. Carbon might be in trouble. And no, he's not. He, and actually, the teleport's going to get stunned by Gojira. So yep. no Brightman teleport coming in, but I think Carbon was fine regardless. We do see three really strange talents on the side of Team Backdoor. Instead of opting for that ability to clear objectives really quickly from the Orc, we do see Paralyzing Rage, which is a still a really strong talent, but still a surprise on a map such as this. Uh, we see Static Barrier giving shields from Mephisto's uh, AoE uh, Lightning Nova, which is also quite unique. And in particular, the strangest talent is pinned down from Maiev, going opting for that quest talent. Uh, if she hits... Uh, three enemies at a time with her Q, she gets permanently more damage on that Q. And if she hits four enemies, she gets all the rewards at the same time, being 40% extra Phantom Knives damage. Hey Malik, do you think he'll get the quest done this game? Yes or no? Uh, four people. <laughs> I, I would say she was going for this quest purely because of how fat Diablo and Blaze is. So it's just really easy to hit a guaranteed two targets. So she, I think the mindset is that Maya just needs to get one more. So she'll be able to stack that quest. But I don't think she'll get it, but it's still possible. Well, we shall see after all. I mean, level 7s are going to be picked up from Team Backdoor already with the XP lead, even though they are down 1 0 in kills. So that proves that show how macro uh, intensive this game is so far. And we get a turn in. Wow, Team Backdoor actually taking a turn in away, even though Medivh is present in this game. I'm very surprised they were able to get that turn in. Yeah, keep in mind that uh, Wild Hearts um, Omega's draft is fine with, uh, as long as... Oh, Medivh is actually in trouble. Yeah, Medivh is okay, going to be fine, fine though. His portal is going to save him. But very close, actually. I think if Chuggy landed both of his stuns, I think Medivh would have gone down. But yep. unfortunately, Chuggy doesn't land both of them. So Medivh is going to heal back up, turn to Owl, and keep on flying. Oh, Lupus gets pulled back by the Maiev. Here comes a stun, but a Ooh, good quick Goro away from Chichogi means that he's not going to get stunned. And here comes Unadverted with the good positioning. Oh, then pop his static shield and do a lot of damage to the side of Wildheart Omega, but not enough to kill anyone. Once again, the good lead from Carbon means that Lupus is not going to get any value with his flip. And this middle objective is going to go down relatively quickly. Uh, not quickly enough. 130 health coming up from Brombala. 
but not enough to finish the job. Yep. I don't know. Oh, Rev's in very, very uh, strange danger. Of course, unadverted. Playing the Mephisto means that he can really jump on the back line and take away kills instantly. Yeah. What I was trying to mention earlier, and as we see it now, oh, Blaze actually being yeah. popped down and losing 21 gems, which is not something you want to see. 21, but, yeah, that is really, really impactful. Like, Wildheart Omega's draft is fine with the condition that um, Team Backdoor does not turn in their objective. As you saw, the first objective, the weakest objective, was able to essentially take out two forts. Like, seeing how low the second, the middle fort is and how the bottom fort was taken out. This is not something you want to see at, in the first objective. Typically, you only see the front gates of like two or three forts going down, not entire buildings falling. Now there is one advantage with the situation now that it is the bottom lane fort going down. As, as always, the top lane uh, is the strongest on Tomb of the Spider Queen, followed by the mm -hmm. mid lane, followed by the bottom lane. But you look at the the health on to both the top and middle forts, and they're basically yeah, the middle one's actually been taken out. Here comes the cocoon with the level ten advantage. Lupin's in the basement and the portal out. The <laughs> the Durus of hate landing onto the oh, Rayman, oh, getting pulled. And Rev's in a big trouble here with no portal available. Is he going to get taken out? No, it's just going to be the Greymate and losing a lot more gems. 26 than gems. Rev's going to try to pick him up, but no, it's not going to happen. Nope. And Wildheart Omega is in a really bad spot now. Yeah, as you can see, like Wildheart Omega hasn't turned in a single time, and they do not have enough gems in their pockets to turn in as it stands. Once again, the snowball is starting to show with the level 10 heroic advantages. They instantly turn themselves onto the boss. This is three forts down, plus boss, seven minutes in the game. This is really oppressive coming in from Team Backdoor. Yeah, there's still a chance though. Medivh has Leyline Seal, and assuming if Diablo goes APOC, they can still turn it around. Uh, however, Diablo's build is quite um, all over the place, I would say. It's quite a hybrid build, because you don't typically see W build with Devil's Dew and Apocalypse together. Which means that he's most likely going to switch over to Q talents going forward. At 13 16. Yeah, I mean, that's if they reach 13 and 16 at this oh, rate. That's, that's rough, dude. It, it, that's it's rough. looking really rough. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, you're only hitting level 10. You're about to get another turn in on the side of the back door with no. Oh, uh, Jachagi tried. I mean, Jachagi was waiting for Rep to drop down and stall, but I guess he didn't. Mm -hmm. Once again, unfortunately, did not land the stun. But it's irrelevant since they're gonna get their next turn in, and this might be a keep or two. Yeah, it's definitely at least. Um several gates um how oh Gojira's oh, gonna go through the portal trying to look for something here but he's all by himself nobody's there and the portal is gonna be dropped off the good cleanse coming oh, from Medivh. Gojira but the Durance of Hate landing onto Rev forces out the three-man yeah, Leyline Steel and here comes the Mayev no Mayev opting not going in and then charges onto the Grey Maid oh sorry on the Medivh the Mephisto the Mephisto actually goes down to the insane amount of CC and burst damage but here we go, the Warden's Cage is oh, activated. Wow. Three members in the Warden's Cage, but there's a bunker right next to them. Jachagi is not enough for you to help, and he's going to go down as well. The portal comes in, and Heavy's in a really bad spot. Liam 30k doing his best to st stall and buy as much time. Of course, the Undead King is doing the best, but he at the end of the day, he's going to come out actually undead. Yeah, keep in mind, even though those on the side of Team Backdoor did die, like all three lanes are being chugged right now. As well as Medivh dying with his stacks incomplete, meaning that his baseline quest, Arcane Rift, has gone back to zero. Yeah, Basically, losing that there. is really, really bad for Medivh. If you want to have a comeback from Wildheart Omega, it doesn't start like that. Losing um, your stacks on your Arcane Rift is a massive blow to your late game and mid game status. I think Middle Keep is gone. Middle Keep is taking a lot of damage and a lot of minions, plus that Merc Camp means that yes, indeed, the Middle Keep is taken out. So we had predicted the one keep going down from this objective. Oh, there's actually an engage going on to Chichuggy here. A good Durance of Hate means that he's not going to go down just yet. Brown Ball is the one actually now in trouble, pulled back from Mayette, but a good four-man lane line. Are you going to see the APOC? It's not nope. even up. <laughs> it's unfortunate. It would have definitely been able to re-engage. But uh, Green Means' cooldowns were burnt, and he didn't have his W attack speed up at the time. Yeah, so we actually do see Wildheart Omega hit 13, so I was wrong about that. They were, but now, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I made a wow. prediction, and the prediction didn't go well, so. We do see Diablo opting for Hellfire uh, as his level 13 talent, meaning that he won't go for uh, Q talents going forward, which I find to be a strange choice 
given how spell damage doesn't really matter too much for Diablo, especially since he went APOC. Yeah, choosing APOC over Lightning Breath means you're opting for more team utility rather than damage. Oh, a good. Here comes a portal engage coming out from Diablo and the Blaze. Pulling Chachuggy is not very good because he's just going to stop up his way out of there. There's a Hate is going to whiff as well. A lot of heroics and engages are misleading. Hmm. Keep in mind that Wild Heart uh, Omega has a lot of gems, but they're none in the bank. So if they die here, essentially they lose their ability to come back. Yeah, and that's this is a good start for Wild Heart Omega, taking Chachuggy down to very little health. Underbird is in a really bad spot. Of course, Mephisto being the one cocoon. But now oh, the turning right. round is here. There's a lot of damage coming out from Liam onto Gojira. Gojira is going to be falling down here. Chachuggy is next to fall as well, pulled back by the Warden's Cage. But Brown Bala is going to be very, very troublesome. Ooh, 500 health down. left, and the entire team is actually just wiped. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, this yeah, is this is end? so dominant coming out from Team Backdoor. I don't think they can end though, unless uh, Grimmy dies. Not sure why he stayed instead of going back. Well, he's there goes all the gems. I mean, Diablo has yeah. 41. He's going to try to pick up a couple. Oh, oh he right, picked 62. up. He picked up 62. Nice. Yeah. Oh, but at this point, it doesn't matter how many gems you have. The core is actually being under siege from the side of mm. T back door. As well as having two siege camps and a catapult means there's going to be a lot of damage coming out. The Entomb actually blocking both the front lines from stopping the core from taking damage. They're going to yeah. start focusing on Liam with the Leoric. The teleport is going to come in and actually save Liam at the end of the day. So this scrappy fight is already looking really bad. Underburn doing his best with the stag field and... Thought of damage taken onto Liam 30k, he's gonna go down, but doesn't matter as game two goes in favor of Team Backdoor. GG and well played. What's saved the game for Team Backdoor and ending it right there and then was then Tomb actually stalling for four whole seconds. Because if you look at the comp of Team Backdoor, their um, siege damage in itself, like their single target siege damage, is actually relatively low. Like a Nubrak and Leoric doesn't exactly scream damage dealer to structures nor does like Medivh or Mephisto. So being able to get those precious extra four seconds was able to secure them the game at the end. So kudos to them. Yeah, so Entomb, even though it's mostly used to trap someone, sometimes placing it in a way that it's very unconventional traps even more people. <laughs> yeah, literally trapped within your own fountain. How do you feel now? <laughs> yeah, but like, what, what can you do at that point, right? <laughs> like, you can't walk out. There's actually no way for them to walk out. Of course, if they have like some kind of leap or some teleport function, mm. they can Diablo get out. Diablo could charge out, uh, but there was no targets to charge to, and Medivh was dead, so they can't uh, teleport out. Yeah, they can't even portal out, I mean. It's a very macro test of the game. I think, like I said, 12 minutes uh, and 12 kills in total. So, I mean, it, it is what it is sometimes. They just completely out macro. <laughs> like, this is like a case study of why wave clear is important. Like, you saw them, like, struggling super hard, even with the first objective. Like, <laughs> this is not something that should happen. Like, two forts down, first objective, when while everyone was still up, that's that's not normal, by any means. Yeah, um, I mean, like, losing four is really bad on Tomb of the Spider Queen on the first phase, but losing two is <laughs> really, really bad. And you saw how good they were snowballing on game one in, on Battlefield of Eternity. So I didn't expect them to really uh, hold up to that point. And yeah, they just kept steamrolling. And they were able to really take structure after structure. They won their last decisive team fight and was able to take it number two. So very, very solid play coming from Team Backdoor. And we hope that this is not a 3-0. I do want to see Wild Heart Omega kind of bounce back. You know, I do think they have a lot of potential. Like you saw that comp actually Diablo and the, and the Tyrande Blaze combo working out pretty well actually. I do want to quickly mention that we were talking about uh, Maev's pin downtown L4 being like if she hits three heroes with a single fan of knives, she'll get additional damage. She was able to stack it uh, four times at the end, so kudos to her. Oh, wow, she actually got all four. <laughs> I, I guess um, uh, it's, it's because... Four, keep in mind, sorry, it's four out of nine, keep in mind, but it's still fairly decent. Yeah. I guess a lot of the stacks came from them ent uh, exiting the portal, so because they mm. all were constructed in one small place, I think might have got a quite a bit of value with those cues. Yeah, I was thinking like maybe those choke points, like between the um, the bruiser camp and where the objective, where you turn in gems, like that really narrow uh, hallway, was maybe where she got her stacks. But maybe you're correct as well. Um. So game number three is, has not been yet decided. I'm going to take you back to the map while we decide.
what map do I want to see picked here? I'm trying to figure out. Hmm. So, of course, Tumina, Spider Queen, Beomi are both up the table. So, all of the maps we have left in this situation is Alterac Pass, Braxis Holdout, Infernal Shrines, Towers of Doom, and Volkskaya Foundry. Now, based on what I have seen, Team Backdoor has done a lot when it comes to securing objectives and kind of capitalizing on these objectives. So, Wild Heart Omega should really take them to a less impactful objective map. Or if they opt for the first pick, Team Backdoor should be taken to a map that's very dependent on objectives and snowball mechanics. Which leads me to think that they're going to pick Brax's Holdout as my prediction. But what do you think what map's going to be picked? I'm thinking it's Brax's Holdout. Um, it's hard to really say at this point because I feel like every prediction we've made in the past has uh, kind of backfired. I will say I do want them to play on a map where you do stand on a central uh, position such as Volskaya uh, because maybe they just need to change the pace essentially like a uh, macro heavy maps simply isn't kind of out for them nor is uh, maps that require lots of racing potential so like you said Braxis or Volskaya would probably be the best bet in uh, like turning around that momentum which Team Backdoor has got yeah, well, they're taking quite a bit of time to decide. I'm sure that Wild Heart Mega is really having a team meeting to kind of decide, hey, we need to wake up, and we're going to get game number three under our belt. And this is very daunting. You know, being down 2-0 in the best of five, it's very, very, like, such an uphill climb. But a good a good uh, tip and strategy is that, you know, you don't have to focus on that climb. You focus on one game at a time. And Wild Heart Mega should really be focusing on game number three. They shouldn't be focusing on winning the whole series just yet. So take it slow, you know, one game at a time. Focus on this map. Get your heads back together, you know, get your focus back up, get the team momentum going. And they can actually take it back all the way to reverse sweep potential. Yep, it's definitely possible, Creep. Like you said, I would hate to see this being a free O, and I do want to see this be a more tight, close, a tight and close race uh, for this series. Yeah, so we, once again, we're still waiting. So uh, they're definitely taking their time thinking. I'm going to turn it back to the cast. And be like, oh, we are just chilling here. Um, I don't know. I, I need to think. I, I have to. It has to be some Lenara ban, right? Like, I'm trying to think. Is there a reason to ban Lenara? I'm gonna go. To, I'm actually gonna do some scouting right now. Like, look at Carbon. <laughs> Carbon doesn't even play Lenara. So, who was the other DPS player? Uh, unadverted. Um, it was uh, unadverted. Yeah. Uh, doesn't play Lenara either. Wow. Okay. Um, interesting. Nor does Liam. Damn, this is a. Uh, I don't understand Lenara band then. I guess they're just, Lenara is just Wait, really oh, strong. Wait, one person. Uh, Heavy plays Lenara. He's the healer, no? <laughs> oh, she doesn't even play it much. I take it back. Yeah, Heavy is the healer, and uh, Lenara is her one of her most played assassins. But Heavy doesn't play too much assassin as the stands. Uh. Interesting, huh? I don't know. Maybe do you think they'll ban Lenara again? I I really don't think uh, it's worth a ban at this point. Like even like if someone does play Lenara, Lenara, like I don't feel like she warrants a ban regardless. <laughs> like if I was let were them, I would just let them have it, essentially. Well, we can stop talking about Lenara. Talk about game number three. If you have predicted Towers of Doom, you are right because I am absolutely wrong. I did not think Towers of Doom was actually going to get picked whatsoever. This is. Definitely something I was not ready for, to be quite frank. Well, it does kind of make sense in a way. This is the map where Broken Dreams uh, and, like, well, just Dreams in general can, like, make comebacks as well. Like, just the map where, like, like with the highest comeback potential as well as the highest potential to snowball as well. Like, anything can really happen here. Yeah, like, if, if, if you have watched my past cast on my own channel, we have casted a lot of Towers of the Doom game. Recently, actually going to like one or two health, like the last two Towers of Doom games that we've casted on our main channel, has gone down to one HP and two HP. Like, yep, it's Both, really yeah. crazy. Both games have literally been reverse sweeps as well. Yeah, it, like it, it's just it's just so much comeback potential, and I think Wildheart really wants to play off that opportunity to say, hey, if we're down, this app can you know can be brought back to their favor but of course this is actually team backdoor picking it so i guess they think that snowballing on towers of doom is something that they're comfortable with so they have gone ahead and picked this scary scary map. 
Yeah, it is definitely a map that um, if your team hasn't practiced a lot, um, it is definitely a map that um, many teams don't feel comfortable playing as well. Which is why it's we often see it banned uh, once in a while. I mean, I don't like playing Towns of Doom. I think when we had our team back then, uh, Malios, we, we, we never it. played this map. This was awful. We were just awful at it. <laughs> because this map in particular takes a lot of practice because if you play, like, say, Cursed Hollow or, like, Infernal Shrines, you can kind of, like, get those experiences and still play other maps relatively well. But this map plays so differently from other maps in, in such a way that, like, you do need to practice this map in particular. And we never practiced, so ha <laughs> ha. That's why we yep. suck at it. But hopefully these two well, teams don't suck at it. <laughs> we still won the series. We still won our division, so... Yeah, we, we, st we, we almost never played on Tower of the Doom. That's why we won. <laughs> we almost played because we just banned it. <laughs> yeah, we... we Easy. I hate this map, man. This map, this. You know, even though I hate this map, this is a good map in this game. Like, I, I think this game oh, is no. really, sure. really good, right? It's very technical, and like there's a lot to cast about it. So definitely it is fun to watch. Yeah. Because anything could happen. Anything indeed, and we will see if something interesting will happen as we get into the draft. Once again, Wild Heart Omega has the option of the first pick advantage. I'm expecting it's probably the same fan, but Lenara? Lenara? I, Come on. I still don't Lenara. understand it. Come on, fan the deer. I would like to say, uh, globals, uh, of course, globals are like good on most maps, but in this map in particular, it is very strong as well. Uh, Junkrat having the ability to displace and to zone enemies off of the point is also quite nice to have, as well as the rip tire burst damage. Well, I don't see Lenara so far. So far, the bands are, even though there's no Lenara, I do think they're kind of regular, you know, Junkrat, Stukov. Basically the same thing, as you mentioned, good point control, and Stukov is very good healing in general. And actually, no Lenara man coming out, so the Nubrak's gonna get picked <laughs> off here. I guess they thought the Jachuggy's uh, Nubrak was a bit too strong, so they want to get it out of the way. It was definitely oppressive in the sense that they were able to Kakuna target, making a, uh, 5v5 into a 4v5 doesn't really help that the 4v5 does have a Medivh, so it is definitely a uphill battle uh, for the side of Wild Heart last round. Stitches does not want to play, he's going to be locked away in his smelly cellar, so we won't see no Hugs or Gorgeous in game number 3. Now the first yep. pick advantage is in the hands of Wild Heart Omega. There's a couple of options they can pick. They can pick a first. They can pick a main tank first, perhaps a Johanna. Pick a good solid uh, double soaker, maybe Leora if they want that, or even the Mouth AO if you're feeling you know a bit giddy. Also, they can lock down some really good uh, DPS. Chromi, for example, would be really strong. Or Nazebo, yeah, Nazebo first pick, not too bad. Hmm. Nazebo, in theory, is a very strong pick, especially in the later half of the game. Um, he still does really well with the spider build early game, like just being able to dish out decent DPS against a single target. I will say, however, that uh, the track record of what we've seen from Nazebos hasn't been the greatest, but hopefully they'll be able to make the most out of the hero. Yeah, of course, we are only we only casted a small portion of the amount of games in NGS, so based on what we've seen, Nazebo hasn't been gathering as much success as we hoped for. So, of course, there could be a lot of other games we didn't count, and the Xebo has just dominated, so we can't really say too much about it just yet. And we're gonna move on quickly to two global picks, the Dahaka and the Brightwing, with the teleport advantages locked in. Team Backdoor, and woohoo, indeed, we see the Hogger and the Blaze lock in. That's very interesting. Uh, as opposed to the previous two games, we do see a main tank Blaze. So that's something uh, which differs quite greatly from previously, where he was stuck in the offlane. So I'm quite curious how they make use of this uh, deviation from the previous matches. Uh, I do want to mention uh, very quickly that Hogger is quite strong in this map, especially of how like the map is structured and like that he's able to just spin around constantly. Yeah, so Hogger does have a lot of room, or actually does not have a lot of room, to, to really bang <laughs> off the walls and hit people. Smack him with your cat. What's that? A cannonball? What is he that he even holds? Like a chain with a cannonball at the end of it? I think so. Now yeah, you well, mention it. Uh, what yeah. is it? Is that is that like a specific name for it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, moving along, actually, we're gonna see the Lucio ban and the Diablo man coming in. You know, I actually respect both bands. There's there's definitely a lot of reason behind it. I guess Lucio, kind of, they don't want to see Lucio with such a you know a hog pile comp as I say. They really just clump up together, and Lucio does very well with them. So the Lucio's ban, the Diablo ban of course is very typical as well. You've seen uh, Jachuggy's 
uh, Diablo doing quite a bit of work in game number one, so they don't want to see them. A lot of target bans on the main tank. So instead, <clears> the target is going to go milk some cows and play the ETC. Well, the cavalry is indeed here. Uninverted playing the tracer. That is pretty interesting. And depending on what um, the side of Wildheart Omega picks, may not get too much value given how tanky their heroes are so far. Oh, interesting. So we're going to see once again the Malfurion locked in and the Maiev making a return in game number three. Um, we did mention that Malfurion in game number one wasn't that successful. So I guess that maybe they had some, some change of plans with this Malfurion. And the lead main is going to once again be locked in by Carbon. Of course, Carbon's lead main, everybody knows about it. Even I know about it. And I don't I don't know most of these players. So <laughs> even I heard how good Carbon's lead main is. So they let that one slip through. Wow, this is this is a much more unorthodox come, coming in from Team Backdoor. You know, started off really relatively, you know, standard, you know, locking double uh, double globals. You know, it's, we see them. And then going for a Tracer ETC is definitely mm. something I was not ready for. ETC can technically be considered global if he goes for stage, uh, stage dive at level 10. But I do kind of want to see some mosh uh, interactions. So we'll see what happens from there. Yeah, we, we don't see a lot of ETC anymore, so it's definitely nice to see the good gold cow back at it, rocking with his tunes. So, mm. both comps have it presented. Do you think one of them has a slight advantage over the other at all, or do you think both are around the same to a point that it comes down to team play? Like, if we're talking purely team fight, I will have to give it to Wildheart Omega, because I don't see the Tracer getting too much value. Um, Tracer, realistically, will only be able to poke uh, and try to melt the Malfurion. But at level 10, Malfurion will be able to have Twilight Dream, meaning that she won't be able to teleport and risk, like put herself at risk. That being said, the macro potential from the side of Team Backdoor cannot be ignored with the double, potentially triple the battle. Begins so we'll see what happens from here. Yeah, seconds. so quickly on the left, we have Team Backdoor with a 2 0 lead, hoping to close out with a flawless victory. Heavy's gonna be playing the Brightwing, Liam Three, gonna be playing the Dahaka, the Chucky on the ETC, Unverted playing the Tracer, and Carbon on his signature leaving. And on the right, we have Wildheart Omega. We have Brown Bala on the Nazebo. We have Gahora on the Hogger. We have Rev on the Maiev. We have Lupus on the Blaze. And we have Slug Hunter on that Malfurion. So both teams are actually not going to go straight to the middle lane. We see a quick clear coming in from Wildheart Omega as they make their way down to the bottom lane. Of course, Hogger is going to do his traditional two lane soaking. And this is where it gets tricky because, oh, Ooh. the stun actually landing onto the Tracer Force on the triple dash. But now the ETC is in trouble, the sleep's gonna come in and teleport's gonna be forced out, but that wall is gonna do so much yeah, damage and Jachuggy is gonna go down instantly. Wow. <laughs> that Tracer's yeah. getting stunned was actually really big. He has to force out with all three of his dashes, and ETC is literally left to kind of peel it, but getting walled mm -hmm. means that there's really no escape. Yeah, for sure. I was actually quite impressed with how Lupus was even able to stun a Tracer. Like, do you know how difficult is it to, like, stun? like using like blazes e like that thing has a delay and tracer is so mobile and like like has a very small hitbox so kudos to him so it's more so i actually think that unaverted just didn't play well in the situation you saw him after getting something he used all three of his dashes so that means that he had his dash option up when he saw blaze walk up but just did not use it in time or just didn't want to use it at all so i think I unaverted needs attention to... perhaps yeah it could be an attention deficit in that situation but you can't be losing concentration at such a important, like I said, a very important set for both teams determining who gets fifth, who gets sixth, essentially. So they really got to focus up and cannot make any more of these kinds of mistakes. Ooh, oh, that was a really good um, W coming from ETCD being able to mitigate the blaze stun. Uh, now he's going to go in onto the Mayev himself, power sliding through, but Rem is going to be just fine. And yeah, like you mentioned, oh, once again, Tracer gets stunned and actually pulled back by my Yev's gonna take so much damage. Is he gonna go down just 200 HP and he's gonna be able to walk out? So oh. this Tracer is definitely getting a lot of targets from the set of Wild Heart Omega. Yeah, what you saw there was just a lot of combo potential for Wild Heart being able to lock someone out. Oh, you do see the ETC being able to cancel a charge from the Blaze with Face Melt. And it's even more. Uh, easier to do so because of loudspeakers at level 4, being able to ha get the extra radius and knockback range. We're going to see rotation from Unadverted onto the top lane. This Hogger is in a lot of trouble. It's going to be forced to use a tornado, but he's not yeah, bouncing hey. into any of the places he wants so well, far. Well, I mean, is he okay? Well, that's a lot of damage. Oh, well, actually fine. misses that. 
Oh, that was actually really close. That was really close, but I mean, I guess Hogger just didn't bounce the way he wanted to bounce. <laughs> he was just—he was just kind of just. I wanna, want I wanna think. I wanna think that it's uh intentional, but you're probably right. <laughs> it, it, but like intentional at all. I think he probably misjudged the angle and that definitely costed him. So a retaliation kill coming in from Team Backdoor. And now Rep's gonna try to cap, but Liam's gonna be tonguing him and say, no, you. <laughs> what? And the top sappers actually get locked in from Tracer, so that's already a huge XP advantage. And doing a lot of structural damage should it get through. And getting a lot of damage on this gate is very, very impactful, especially in the top lane, but it isn't a lot of ways to monitor the damage. So you see Hogger trying to do his best by clearing, but Oh, Liam's gonna actually teleport in. Is he gonna get stunned? No, he isn't. He's actually gonna get his channel in, and the burrow comes through. It is a 4v4 situation. You see the, the dig coming in, the tongue actually Ooh. missing. Yeah, you saw there the hawker committing to that barrel, meaning that he has to walk all the way top lane to match the hawker soak. I mean, it was actually fine, because if you were watching the top lane, Liam 30k left the uh, left the top lane when there was no minions left on the side of Wild Heart of Manga, so he actually didn't lose anything when he burrowed down. And Gojira can't really rotate because he has to clear a massive wave, about 10 minions worth of XP. That's a fair point. Like, he already cleared his side of the wave, and since Hogger was stuck top, he was hoping to force a 5v4 five, five, five situation. Indeed. And O'Malley Hots in the chat have given a sub to Sky Park. Thank you for the sub and the support for the NGS. I hope you're enjoying your games as much as we are. Definitely. Uh, and of course, Sky Park, enjoy your tier 1 sub. A good generous to get from O'Malley. Oh, Rev's taking a lot of damage, but a good invulnerability means that he's able to walk out. I don't know if he's actually doing quite a bit of damage being a Tracer this early in the game. And oh, Blaze's charge oh, actually got interrupted. And yes, we're going to see a Blaze lockdown from Team Backdoor. A good composition from Tuchuggy. And actually doing very well in this ETC so far, I would say so myself. Yeah, unfortunately, Blaze either didn't have his trait or didn't uh, wasn't able to pop it off. Because if he was able to, he could reduce damage to nearby enemies by 40% while getting that extra 40 armor. And we're gonna see the sappers locked in from Li Ming here. Tracer is getting rooted here. Oh, a Ooh, good attempt from Tuchuggy, but it's not enough. Rev, of course, does have his. I don't even know the leap. What's the leap thing called from Maya? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I don't deny really Maya often enough to know. <laughs> oh, here Ooh, comes the stun Tracer. onto Tracer. He is rooted and slept, but he's actually gonna get soft cleansed by the Bright Wings and be able to walk it out of line. Now, Heavy's in a bit of trouble. Doesn't have the he access tried. to the blink kill just yet. The re engage from Jutuggy means that Wildheart has no choice but to back off. Like, Wildheart needs to force as soon as possible because Tan is approaching um, Team Backdoor. So they do, they do need to force a fight. Yeah, so Unaverted with 70% charge on his ultimate. So if he's going to have it in this next fight, should he just be autoing a bit more? And then also they're just going to both trade Alters, which is actually the best case scenario for Wildheart and Mega. You know, trading one for yep. one in Alters is anything you can ask for when you're down 10. Yep, it's definitely the best case scenario for them. And we do see several uh, standout alts coming from the side of Backdoor. In particular, we have Mosh Pit, so that's something to be excited for. We I also mean... do see Sticky Bomb coming from the Tracer as well, being able to slow targets by 70% for 3 seconds. Yeah, Mosh Pit means that we won't see a triple global. Like, we, we, I have seen in the past, you know, triple cheese comp globals when there's all of the people TP to a top lane, perhaps, and just start sh hitting structures. Mm. But they have not opted for that <laughs> kind of cheeky play instead of going for the, you know, traditional Mosh Pit. Be able to get a lot of stun and CC potential. Should Jachucky land a pretty good Mosh Pit. Mm. We do see tens coming from the side of uh, Wild Heart Omega. And wow, we, we see Shockwave from Hogger, meaning that he opted for the stun rather than the dive, which is not something you see very often. Yeah, Shockwave actually being opted from um, Gojira here on the Hogger, and here we go, we might see a fight here. Liam is okay, in a really rough spot, but who knows, you know who else is in a really uh, rough spot too? There's Malfurion in the really middle of nowhere. The Tons is going to land onto the Nazebo, but the Isolation is going to be followed up, means that he won't be able to put down a good stun coming from Gojira, but it's not enough to say Nazebo, the Wish Doctor uh, is going to go down, and so is the crazy uh, one, and a good Mosh Pit means that, ladies and gentlemen, we might see a, a very good team wipe in from team backdoor and yes all five members going down in a very clean fight oh, that's so unfortunate like it started off with the Malfurion being out of position like for some reason he was like the furthest out during the team fight and like one by one those on the side of Wildheart just got picked off 
Yeah, so I think what happened in the teamfight was uh, Liam's, uh, his E, what is it called? His, sorry, his Burrow, yeah, his Burrow actually knocked Malfurion away from his team and unfortunately into this tide of Team Backdoor's loving arms. So I guess that, that kind of contributed, but once again, Malfurion really shouldn't have been in that position to even begin with. Uh, very quickly, I just want to mention that um, Team Backdoor was unable to get that extra shot onto the enemy core because they mistimed their um, channel. Well, speaking of channel, this is a lot of channeling damage onto it. Here comes wow. a good, good Twilight Dream locking down the two frontline members, but actually, by yet going down in the background, Underbird is actually under tower. Oh, a oh. good blink kill? Oh, he oh. actually made. Now, kudos to Heavy wow. saving the Tracer. That is a very high level play. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was done for sure. And listen, you know who's not done? Team Backdoor. They want to go back in Liam 30k, forcing out the bunker, but now Gojira without his tornado is going to be in a bad position. Hot into the bunker, and they're able to get out with only one casualty. Yeah, Tracer, like aside from the really good play coming out from the Brightwing, like you saw the value out of Tracer's level 13 talent, giving him her that extra 8%. Uh, maximum help as a shield. Yes, so picking Jumper, of course, is the option. And they're able to take down this middle keep by Wildheart Omega. So they're going to get back what they have lost. So, so right now the structures are even, but if you look at the kill count, 8-2 to two is not very even at all. Mm. I do want to mention, similar to game 1, Leeming, uh, Corbin's Leeming did opt to go for um, Glass Canyon again with the Calamity. Uh, enabling her to deal uh, dish out extra damage. Uh, for the price of her health. Cool. Oh, so now we're gonna see four members, and all five members here, Stace is gonna come out from oh. the Liam 30k and instantly blown up is Malfurion. I mean, and the Ice Lace is gonna come through. I mean, oh. what, I mean, at this point, what what can you do? <laughs> what can you do? Like, like you see Nazebo trying his best, but he's in the Zebo and this Brawn Ball is gonna go down basically the next target to fall. A teleport coming in from the Brawny and really secure as this kill. It's just getting knocked around yeah, like he's, crazy. He's just getting slapped. <laughs> Bounced around like uh, like a, uh, Gojira's tornado on the Hogger, so <laughs> that makes no difference, really. Yeah, Naz is like the pinball, and like Team Backdoor is the machine. Yeah, like that is that is just bullying and borderline. <laughs> That's actually brutal. And now this, the shots have come up to 32 to 19, 16 to 13 late. I mean, wow, Heart Omega, you're looking at a really rough climb back to the top. So now with the bottom four in control by a team back door, now they can start camping this position, preventing really wow, Heart Omega from doing anything. Carbon just sieging away with his magic missiles, and there's really nothing they can do unless they start a hard engage under the tower of ta uh, team back door. Here it comes, Rev trying to go in, but instantly stunned by Jachuggy, and Heavy is going to be able to be just fine. Forces out the Time Bomb, uh, sorry, Time Bomb, Pulse Bomb, sorry, from Tracer, but it's not enough to kill Rev just yet. Let's take a look at the top lane, Liam 30k and Gojira really going ham, the Isolation is out, is this enough damage to kill it? Oh, the Tongue misses, so that is not going to go up, but it is going to force out the ultimate there. Let's, let's pave it back to the bottom lane. You see Maiev soaking as much XP as he can in the middle lane. Being down 16 to 14 means that he's going to have to do some minion duty. While Unavert is going to start on the Sapper camp and try to force us into another three shots onto the core. The triple ultra phase is going to come through this. We see Maiev trying to do something to Liam. Tongue is going to come out to buy enough time. But is that enough time for Liam to get out? He's going to try to do some dodging. He's going to force out the Brightwing teleport. And yeah, he's going to be able to make it out just fine. I do want to mention how much more dangerous Team Backdoor is at level 16. They have two uh, armor reduction talents with Tracer and Brightwing, as well as Mirror Ball coming from Ming. You know what we also see? We also see a dead Dahaka. Nope. Double Barrow talents. Flaming <laughs> Claws. Yeah, he really wants to play safe by choosing it. And now Triple Ultra Base, like we have mentioned, Gojira is going to do his best to kind of stop Heavy from capping, but he can't stop Underverde either. Oh, ETC? ETC? What happened to ETC? He's just buying time, oh, I guess, Chuggy. Yeah. He is just buying time at the end of the day, but is it the time worth it? Now we're going to oh, see Gojira and Heavy, and actually, Trace and Tower diving like crazy, sniping Maiev off the face of the map, forcing him back to the fountain for the next 30 seconds. Wow, like, I'm not sure if you were watching, but Maiev was like, 
being chased by Tracer for like the longest time. Damn, I was not watching. The tongue actually missing from Liam 30k. Actually stopping the ultimate. Wow, the actually burrowed pop up stopped the ultimate from Hogger. He was not able to stun and get away. That's yeah. very, Tracer, very. Tracer has been stalling like very well, like against a 3v1, and was able to, to stall for the side of Team Backdoor to come back and finish them off. I mean, at this point, this is just slaughter. There is no stopping Team Backdoor. They don't need to go back there when they can just walk through the front door and really lock themselves a very monstrous lead. I'm assuming Azeev is going to go down here as well. Oh, it's his hitting tower. <laughs> Damn. This it's is... Kind of BM. That is really BM. Just opting to go for a structure rather than an Azeev. Shows that Team Backdoor is really feeling themselves at the moment. Yeah, for sure. Like, mid keep is about to fall down. Top is getting chunked as well. I think they'll be able to get bottom before top will get picked off. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, with all three alters in favor yep. of Team Backdoor, this game is actually over. It's over. Nobody is going to stop heavy. And ladies and gentlemen, in a very, very convincing 3-0 fashion, we're going to see Team Backdoor take down Wildheart Omega in this week's Storm Division. GG. And well played. I mean, if that's not dominance, I don't know what is. All three games have really been strong in the favor of Team Backdoor. I don't think Wildheart Omega really had like a good grasp of a lead in any of those games. Yeah, I agree. Like all three games, Team Backdoor seems to be like at the forefront of like basically being ahead the entire time. Like this game in particular, their kill count was 18 to 3. And keep in mind that us casters predicted that uh, Wildheart had the better team fight draft, but just being able to rotate and force the enemy into uh, unfavorable conditions such as like 4v5s, 3v2s, these are the fights that won team backdoor the game. Yeah, so we're going to see if we can get a quick interview with the captain or anybody on the team of uh, team backdoor. Let's see if somebody does want to give us a little bit of a debrief because damn like you just see you just see the scoreboard and the only person that's gone down this game was etc <laughs> yeah he, at least he's gone down three times he's gone out all three times but everybody else quite honestly untouched like i really think that everybody on the side of team backdoor played exceptionally well today and whether it was game one game two or game three there's always one and they at least performed really well in one of those games you yeah, agree they definitely put on a really good show tonight very convincing 3-0, but now this is where it gets close. Because I think they're actually very, very close to 4th or 3rd place. And I think they have one more match to go, if I recall correctly. So they're going to really have to push if they want a better position or a better shot at making it playoffs. Or not making it They're all pretty much guaranteed in playoffs, but they have to get themselves in a better position. To higher the chances of actually winning the whole thing. So they're definitely be working hard. I think this is the last game by Wildheart Omega. They're going to finish 6th, I believe. But that is still enough to get them through to the playoffs. And unfortunately, we aren't able to get an interview. So that means that's going to be the end of tonight's series. Unfortunately, it seems like Team Back to just want to say, well, we'll take it easy tonight. No need for an interview. We're going to celebrate it our way. And here, I'll just show you the talents before we take it back to the caster duel screen. Before we send you guys all off, I'm sure somebody... Uh, in the Nexus uh, Gaming Series moderator will probably raid another streamer. But if not, that is actually going to be it from the two of us. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in for tonight's Storm Division game. Uh, if you are, like I said, this is the last week for the Storm Division game. So starting on October 4th, we're going to actually see the playoffs being commencing. So stay tuned for those. I'm sure you guys are all excited to really see teams battling for their playoff lives. But until then, ladies and gentlemen, that is it from me, Creepers Bot, your caster. And of course, as long as I'm Eve, Mali is always there. It's a pleasure to help me commentate. And until next time, NGS fam, we'll see you next time.